So today is the fourth lecture of Professor Arato. And I think uh, the lecture will deal with uh, example from uh, Eastern Europe and also present, let's say, a conclusion of the four lectures. So, uh, please. Yes, two Boys birds with, uh, with one stone. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Rosa Malone. And again, uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to have been able to uh, be here and to uh, do these uh, uh, lectures. Uh, uh, the title of today's is going to be called Regime Change and Legitimacy with a special look at the Hungarian case. Transitions to democracy and constitution making forms. Ever since 1989, the question whether the transitions to democracy in Central Europe were revolutions has been an intense subject of debate. Behind this debate lies a rigid alternative of reform or revolution. Since the transformations were not reforms compatible with or preserving systemic identities, they had to be supposedly revolutions an idea confirmed by the presence of large masses on the scene in some, but only some countries. In my second lecture here, I presented a four-part schema developing a proposal by Janusz Kisch as the most productive way of transcending the reform-revolution dichotomy, extremely misleading for many of these important cases. To sum up now, using the double polarity of legality and legitimacy on the one hand, and continuity and rupture on the other, I outline four major forms of transition, namely revolution, revolutionary reform, regime change, as well as reform. I maintained that one specific democratic type of constitution making, ideal typically, corresponds to each transition type, or rather two in the case of revolutionary reform. I call these forms, these five forms in effect, constituent assembly and convention, plebiscitary, parliamentary, and roundtable-led forms. Last time, relying on an imminent critique of two social scientific theories, uh, hegemonic preservation and insurance theories, I introduced the key contrast between self-interested particularistic conversion and universalistic guarantees, and concluded that the normative advantage of the roundtable lies in its production of legitimacy based on likely, though not inevitable, combinations of empirical veil of ignorance, inclusion, usually legality, publicity, and competitive elections. It is this theme that I wish to resume today. After casting a brief glance at the return of reform and revolution, I would like to show how the legitimacy problem allows us to understand the deformation and defeat, possibly temporary, of the round table model in Hungary. But first I want to speak about legitimacy in more general terms. Again, I believe the core gain of the round table led regime change model has to do with the generation of political legitimacy. This gain is not always actualized, however. When it is not, the success of the model is under threat. I have in mind legitimation in the sociological rather than the philosophical sense even if the two cannot be separated entirely. Thus, it is a matter of justifications of rule empirically available, one that the citizens, groups, and administrative staffs are likely to find valid under the given historical circumstances. This should not be confused with legitimacy as a normative matter from the point of view of moral philosophical reflection. One perspective is from the observer's point of view, the other focuses on the probable views of participants, the legitimacy offerings of elites, and the chances of acceptance by others. While legitimacy from a philosophical point of view can even be imputed to constitutions on the basis of their content, legitimacy from the sociological point of view is more likely to depend in part at least on the process of constitution making. Even an otherwise acceptable liberal democratic constitution is open to challenge based on the manner that it was made. While the philosophical meaning of legitimacy of constitutions can perhaps be ascertained from the liberal point of view, 
The sociological has an internal relationship to the democratic one. However, as Habermas once realized, an analysis focusing on sociological legitimacy, unless it is to work through unreliable surveys, cannot entirely dispense with normative considerations. This has, however, mainly an epistemic or hermeneutic rather than normative function in helping to identify the norms in society or in a process that are meant to play and can play a legitimation role in the sociological sense. It is important not to substitute the analyst's own views of what is legitimate and illegitimate for the views of the relevant actors, but to use the former, the analyst's views, as the basis of interpretation to discover what empirically can and cannot be made legitimate. But only the existence of social contestation concerning legitimacy can confirm that the analyst's discovery of legitimation problems is based on empirical insight rather than normative projection. This means that normative considerations of legitimacy or illegitimacy too can be said to have an effect on legitimacy in the empirical sense, thus on deficits and crises of legitimation, but only if important actors in politics turn the normative into the empirical. To ascertain that this is happening requires a two-step analytical procedure, first normative and then empirical. According to the logic of my scheme and of the four forms, only revolution and regime change involve full ruptures of legitimacy. Thus it might seem, uh, thus it might seem have problems of legitimation to solve. To the extent, however, that a new constitution is to be made, in my view, all the forms have significant legitimation problems, even if the protagonists of the round table seem to be the only ones fully aware of these. In the case of reform, a simple mechanical constitutional amendment by a legally established legislature using the existing revision rule admittedly has no legitimation problems. Here, Max Weber's legal legitimacy is sufficient. When, however, that rule, that same rule, is used to replace a whole constitution, that raises important normative questions among participants, especially where such an, option, such an option was not explicitly provided for. Written constitutions and the distinction between constituent, constituent and constituted powers have been historically introduced to limit the ability of incumbent governing authorities to change the fundamental rules of the game. And a, and a reform that does so is prima facie problematic. This was the great insight of the Indian judges of the basic structure doctrine fame, who did not even have codified eternity rules to rely on. The problem is only exacerbated when the ease of replacement is facilitated by highly disproportionate electoral outcomes and an easy one-dimensional amendment rule. In the case of revolutions, to be sure, New revolutionary legitimacy is generated, linked to the processes of liberation by an often charismatic elite or leadership. Here, the high-level involvement of the masses in the overthrow of an old regime can establish a kind of identity between liberating elites and large population sectors. Nevertheless, in a complex society, there may be large-scale agreement concerning what should be replaced, but less likely concerning what should be put in its place. The friend-enemy relations thus quickly alter in the midst of revolutions. When an elite imagines that its earlier credits earn it the right to dominate the constituent process and to impose a constitution through either minority will or even a narrow majority, there is likely to be broad opposition to these efforts. Revolutions not only start almost definitionally in civil war, but can also lead to new ones, as in France in the 1790s and Russia after the dissolution of the Constituent Assembly. This is a sign of a contest around legitimacy, and the repressive nature of post-revolutionary regimes is a tacit admission of a fundamental legitimation problem of the need to replace hegemony by domination using Gramsci's terms. With the exception of the American cases and Western Germany, it is variously systemic and normative problems that undermine legitimacy for what I call revolutionary reforms. The plebiscitary mode shares its normative problems with revolution. 
Moreover, given the instability of plebiscitary democratic support, resting on momentary states of will, and the weakness of its representative capacity, the model is likely to suffer from an aggrieved version of the problem of dual democratic legitimacy analyzed by Juan Linz in the case of presidential regimes. Even when democratic legislatures are suspended, many citizens are likely to find alternative and more plausible instances of representation in civil society, often religious elites. The, repress the repressive nature of such politics is again the likely testimony to this. But even the Republican option, the one that Bruce Ackerman analyzed, centering on constitutional conventions, has a serious difficulty when legal rules are ruptured, as it was clear around the time of the adoption of the US federal constitution. Moreover, as I argued in my first lecture, unless there is great normative and even sociological homogeneity among the various Republican institutions, as in that one American case, the alternative claims of popular sovereignty by competing institutions the normal legislatures and the constitutional convention can easily lead to dual power, new ruptures of legality, and serious challenges to the legitimacy of the body that wins the struggle. Not surprisingly, these conflicts have been managed historically either by overarching or underlying federal arrangements, as I stressed several times now, uh, but as in West Germany also by an external occupation. Elsewhere, the outcome can easily be a constitution without legitimacy, as in Russia after 1993, or one whose legitimacy is constantly challenged. Finally, in the case of the regime, of regime change, the type that I'm treating here most of the time, the actors themselves are generally aware of their legitimation problems. This is a great advantage and leads, I believe, to the superiority of this model. Negotiating with old regime actors who have lost their legitimacy, including new ones in agreement with the old, excluding others, making agreements whose quid pro quo character but can be justified only in terms of a strategic modus vivendi, are all problematic from the point of view of democratic legitimacy, and the main actors recognize it as such. This is why, at its best, this model turns out to be a factory of legitimation, introducing elements like public openness, inclusion of new participants, fully consensual decision rules, as well as treating the fictional legality of old regimes as actual, as if they could be made elements of the rule of law. And even this is not enough. The participants also tend to affirm the merely provisional nature of their constitutional product, their inability to completely substitute for free elections, and the making of the final constitution by those elected under these rules. While it is not only unproblematic, but logically required to establish an independent body enforcing the initial agreement, it is equally important to make these agreements in such a way that the final process retains its open and democratic quality. Thus, in general, the big exception here is South Africa, the enforcement is limited only to procedural aspects. The return of reform and revolution. While I do claim normative advantage for the round table model in both empirical and philosophical senses, I have repeatedly insisted also here on its bad determined nature that puts it somewhere between American exceptionalism and a universal method, probably impossible, that would be practicable anywhere at any time. In particular, reform must already have failed, with revolutionary overthrow being or being seen as impossible before forces on government and opposition sides consent to the kind of negotiation process that characterizes the roundtable form. Even after such a mutual consent, it generally takes relative equality of forces and or serious uncertainty about the future to produce a constitutional result, as I argued last time. So what happens where either reform or revolution are possible? Does the paradigm that I stress lose its relevance? There are two reasons why this is not the case that I will only illustrate today. First, there is the international transmission of ideas that is certainly a clue to why in distant South Africa, a model is adopted so similar to Spanish, Polish, Hungarian, and Bulgarian forerunners. This aspect, stressed by Heinz Klug, does not necessarily stop at the door of revolution and reform. I have written on the adoption of the multi-stage interim final format in Iraq, where in my view there was an externally imposed revolution. While that adoption was coupled with deformation, 
we cannot easily tell whether the deformation was caused by the externally imposed or the revolutionary character. In Nepal, for example, there was also a legal rupture, and negotiations for an interim constitution took place only among oppositional forces. This process, though made difficult by the intensity of identity politics, could still succeed. Reform, too, has reappeared in our time. While sometimes considered impossible, as the case of Mexico shows, reiterated liberalizing reforms over a long period can also produce replacement of regimes. Nevertheless, the legitimation problems of reform as well as revolution insisted on here remain. This is shown by the failure of Turkey so far, itself a case of successful reiterated partial reforms between 1995 and 2002, to produce an entirely new civilian constitution that has been now demanded by the EU. Abandoning the consensual process char characteristic of the early phase, the present governing party has so far managed to push through only questionable packages of amendments with the help of referenda. The Turkish case reveals the second way the new paradigm can become relevant beyond its own type of path. Given the existence of partially democratic and constitutionalist constitutions, the two-stage process and the making of an interim constitution are hardly conceivable or necessary here as against revolutionary cases like Iraq and Nepal. But I insist nothing would stop detaching the legitimation framework of the roundtable form and utilizing it under new, perhaps innovative institutional conditions. I have recommended one such a scheme in Turkey already, combining forms taken from the convention and the roundtable both. At issue is not the specific model that I cooked up. What I insist on is that the forms of legality, inclusion, public openness and involvement, as well as the election of the last drafting assembly in elections primarily for that purpose, is possible even under revolution and reform. In Turkey, we see some signs that at least partially uh, we see some signs that at least partially the legitimation scheme I have in mind is being followed. Returning to the older Turkish pattern, a parliamentary reconciliation commission has been formed based on the parity of four parties. There have been an extens extensive and serious public and civil society consultation as well. Let us hope that there will be a result, one that the parliamentary majority can live with. This majority just misses the three-fifths threshold and thus cannot pass a constitution on its own, unlike in 2011, even with the help of a referendum. But it can veto a consensual product, thereby producing nothing, as we will see from the history of the Hungarian case, to which I now turn. The Hungarian case and its relationship to the new paradigm. There have been several types of challenges difficult to reconcile with one another to treating the Hungarian process as an example of the new paradigm of transition and constitution making. The first points to its uniquely fragmented or, patch or patchwork character. Another to the achievement of what seems to be a permanent constitution already in 1989. Yet another, looking at this document formalistically as the amendment of the 1949 constitution, denies that there has been constitutional replacement at all. Finally, another still, only partially compatible with the previous, treats the roundtable agreements as a corrupt bargain in which the previous elite dominated. This is incidentally a point of view also present in that previous elite, the ex-communist party, but with reverse evaluation, choosing to regard the new as the result of, the mere, of mere reform. The study of the history of what has been achieved and how it was done possibly, possible, fortunately, on the basis of the available sources leads to the rejection of all these claims. Nevertheless, the Hungarian case is unique. As I have argued elsewhere, of the major components of the developed model, it has satisfied all but one, the completion of the second stage in terms of the free election of a non-sovereign constitutional assembly and the production of a final constitution. The effort to make the final constitution in 1994 and 1996 failed nor do I regard the so-called fundamental law recently enacted as the conclusion and completion of the model, but as I will explain, its subversion by a process of illegitimate reform. This to me is a serious matter from the point of view of political legitimacy. The Hungarian model, as many participants of the roundtable realized, has all the legitimation difficulties of this model in general, adding some Hungarian specificities. <clears throat> 
None of the participants were democratically elected. I'm talking about 1989 now. The old ruling party played a more important role than in some other cases. The new participants, though they established their credentials in what was called the Oppositional Roundtable, were formally present on the invitation of the ruling party, except for Fidesz that was brought in against the will of that party. Others, like the small Hungarian October party, were excluded and demonstrated against this exclusion. Public visibility and accountability were weak, due, to the, due especially to the wishes of the old ruling party. The presence of the old parliament in the process was too active, repeatedly modifying some of the agreements. There were well-founded rumors of private deals between leaders of the old ruling party and new party leaders that violated the consensual nature of the agreements. Subsequently, the process allowed a relatively large-scale conversion of previous political to new economic powers. While a program of retributive justice was rightly excluded, rightly in my view, nothing like a truth and reconciliation process was provided for. Most seriously, while the new constitution was formally pronounced as provisional, no procedures were enacted concerning the making of the final constitution. Thus, the illusion was created that a non-democratic, only partially legitimated instance, the round table, or were still the last communist parliament, created Hungary's final constitution. At the same time, leaving the single chamber amendment rule of the 1949 constitution in place, the expectation was created that governments in power, power will repeatedly modify the new constitution according to their shifting interests as incumbents. This idea was confirmed by the Pact of 1990 of two opposing parties, SDS and MDF, with less than 50% of the popular vote that modified the Constitution substantially without, however, producing an entirely new one. I do not say that the process was therefore not legitimated at all, as part of the right has always claimed, and Fidesz repeats now. The inclusion of nine very different participants in the round table was a wider one than anywhere in Central Europe. The plenary sessions, at least, were public. The rule of law was rigorously maintained, and the referendum of 1989 overcame the corrupt bargain concerning the election of the President of the Republic. That was the only moment of popular participation in the process important for that very reason. But to produce the full political legitimacy associated with the model, its completion would have been, de would have been very desirable. This could have been done even without the initial enactment of the necessary rules, by using the existing amendment rule to produce new rules. It was important, however, in this process to avoid even the appearance that a new constitution would be expressing merely incumbent advantage and a desire for the political preservation of power. The imposition of a new constitution by electoral winners was indeed avoided in 1995 to 1996, with a coalition having over 70% of the seats enacting highly consensual rules for constitution making. These rules provided that 80% of parliament, four fifths, had to agree to new procedural rules, and that a parliamentary constitutional committee based on inclusion and consensual principles would be created. This was indeed a potentially successful way of ending the process adding new democratic and pluralistic legitimacy to the result, enabling the actors to establish a new amendment rule that would close the process unless very large majorities of both legislature and the population chose to reopen it in the future. That this process failed was a very serious blow to constitutional legitimacy in Hungary. The, the, the fact that it failed because of the initiative and obstruction of leaders of the, ruling, of the old ruling party again dominant in government, only increased the false impression that the roundtable constitution was their achievement, one that they would seek to preserve. In this context, as far as the political right was concerned, even the constitution interpreting and defending role of the constitutional court could be seen as supporting ultimately a corrupt arrangement, a perception reinforced by the fact that key members of the court were not at all enthusiastic about the legislature completing the process by enacting a new constitution. Of course, the more radical right-wing parties of that time helped to bring the, the 1996 project down, but this did not stop their attacks on the constitution they helped to leave in place. Thus, on balance, I believe that the Hungarian constitution-making process never overcame its legitimation problems. Only, a, only the consensual conclusion of the process by a democratically elected assembly could have done so. <clears throat> 
the new Hungarian fundamental law and the legitimacy problem. In my interpretation, the sociological legitimacy of the Constitution was not satisfied either by the appeal to legality or to fundamental liberal and democratic norms incorporated in the document. I'm pretty confident that the survey literature from a now 20-year period dealing with constitutional values and their acceptance would sustain this judgment. What I focus on instead and did from the early 1990s is the challenge from the right that I considered in part unjustified because misconstruing the facts and achievements of the roundtable process, but justified to the extent that the defenders of the new regime did not satisfy the initial promises explicit in constitutional text as well as implicit in their very procedures in both 1989 and 1996. This promise was one to replace the bargained constitution by a democratic as well as a consensual one. Such is the heart of the, of the sociological legitimacy problem, and it opened the door to Istvan Churka's critique in the 1990s, as well as Viktor Orban's in 2010. Thus, Orban's so-called revolution of the voting booth is a true inheritor of the earlier demand for a second revolution. The existence of a disproportional electoral rule, along with the old amendment rule of the Constitution implying parliamentary sovereignty, only made the job of the new revolutionaries more easy. Let us look at the process the Fidesz-led government engaged in in the making of the new fundamental law. I will use my earlier typology here not to make a fetish of classification, but in order to pinpoint the legitimation problems of the making of the new fundamental law. While some will argue that this process represents the missing completion of the roundtable paradigm, I very strongly disagree with this and wish to provide the interpretive grounds for the disagreement based on comparative and theoretical considerations. I believe that it is essential to the constitution-making method linked to the new paradigm of transition stressed here that it is post-organ sovereign in all of its stages and as a whole that none of the protagonists of the several stages, the round table, the normal parliament, and the constitutional court claim to fully embody the will of the sovereign people. No organ of state or government is supposed to be sovereign without limitations. In Hungary now, one organ, Parliament, did explicitly claim to fully embody the sovereign constituent power of the Hungarian people. While not elected as such, nor given any kind of mandate to produce a new constitution, Parliament declared itself formally a sovereign constituent assembly on the basis of barely more than 50% of the votes to its majority. Consistently with that conception, the rule established in 1995-96, the four-fifths rule I refer to, requiring consensus among parties beyond the government alone, was not only disregarded, but was explicitly repealed by two-thirds of the vote. Four-fifths rule repealed by a two-thirds vote. That mood would have been unconstitutional prima facie, but was not really vulnerable to invalidation because of the previous, in my view, mistaken declarations of the Constitutional Court rejecting amendment review. In any case, the Fidesz government made impossible its litigation through packing the constitutional courts by eventually six new members. This, this removed the only check of parliamentary sovereignty in the Hungarian system, the court, whose jurisdiction was already curtailed by amendment earlier in that year. Comparison with the 1995 process that remained under the jurisdiction of the court is again instructive. So was it a process that, while not completing the earlier regime change, reenacted its logic. The use of the old amendment rule and the challenge to the existing constitution's legitimacy in the preamble of the new fundamental law, as inconsistent as these two acts were, point in the direction marked by legal continuity legitimation break. With respect to the constitution-making procedure, however, this Fidesz-led process, unlike the one started in 1989, had only one stage, only one major agent, and as already said, organ sovereignty was asserted. Thus, not only one, but many features of a new paradigm are not present. Thus, we cannot even speak of a marginal case here. There also cannot be a question here of recourse to two other transition types, the options of revolutionary reform and revolution. Both require ruptures of legality, and I do not think that the limited illegalities involved can be interpreted as a legal rupture. Revolution also requires break with the old principle of legitimacy and the building of a new one. This was inconsistently claimed here, but without serious foundations. 
Not only was the legitimation rupture not as complete as in revolutions, whatever claims made by the preamble, there was no other legitimation principle proposed than parliamentary sovereignty embodying popular sovereignty, and this, alas, was already established in the 1989-1990 regime, if inconsistently, given especially the creation of such a strong constitutional court. Accordingly, the new fundamental law in its final provisions claims authority for its makers on the basis of the very amendment rule in place since 1949, something that was not done even in 1989. The round table did not claim its authority to recommend from any provision of the 1949 constitution to which it was unknown as an institution. It is true, as in 1989, this amendment rule was used to produce a completely new constitutional text, but this time there were a lot fewer substantive changes. If 1989 was not a revolution, and it was not, then neither was 2010. It was not even a counter-revolution, despite the presence of a genuine counter-revolutionary force, Jobbik, in Parliament, a party that, by the way, did not support the new draft. At most, it is contrary revolution in the sense of Joseph de Maistre, that is reversing revolutionary results by methods other than a revolution. So reform is left as the main possibility. Accordingly, I first interpreted the fundamental law as a particularly large amendment package, package similar to one enacted in Turkey in the previous year that also involved packing of the court and alteration of its powers. But it was pointed out to me that I also wanted to say that the fundamental law threatened many aspects of the rule of law state and thus involved potentially replacement of regimes that would be incompatible with reform. But I add, only with legitimate reform. It's under the basic structure doctrine, ordinary amendments that threaten fundamental components and therefore the identity of the Constitution are indeed illegitimate. In India, they're also illegal or have been made illegal by a long tradition of court precedents, even without explicit textual guidance as by, it, as by the eternity clauses of the Grundgesetz and the Turkish Constitution of 1982. The problem, in Hungary there's neither a relevant set of precedents nor appropriate codification entrenching parts or principles of the Constitution on a higher level than the rest. Thus what remains to be said is that the fundamental law and its enactment are legal but illegitimate or in the very peculiar British usage, unconstitutional but legal. Thus the process Fidesz pushed through was on the whole legal. That is why I call it reform. But again, it was not legitimate, in part because of its own claims rejecting the legitimacy of its own ground, and in part because of how it was done. More exactly, the legitimacy problem of this process had to do with it was, uh, the, the, the legitimacy problem of this process has to do with how it was done in light of what was done. Or what was done could have been done legitimately only through a different process. It is not only from my external point of view that the process had serious legitimacy problems. The fact that it was non-consensually adopted without even the use of referendum was continually pointed out by all other political actors. The contrast with 1994, 1996 was obvious. So were the inconsistencies of many new elements adopted with the basic structure of constitutionalism as well as parliamentary government. To the first group, constitutionalism belonged the attacks on the constitutional and other courts, the removal of jurisdiction, the court packing, and the forcible retirement of ordinary judges. The second group, the attacks on parliamentarism, includes first and foremost the establishment of long-term offices and tenures, and the multiplication of organic two-thirds laws, both restricting the, poli the policy options of future freely elected governments. One set, the first, will make the protection of rule of law more difficult. The other set will make democratic government weaker and less accountable. The electoral law that has been enacted finally is likely to be even more disproportional than the current one, implying a calculation, right or wrong, that Fidesz will get an equal number of seats with much fewer votes the next time around. Given a linked and fully computerized gerrymander of districts, this is an incumbent protection measure incompatible with the essence of written democratic constitutions that seek to protect the polity against the self-preservation incumbents. While the calculation behind introducing the new electoral law could turn out to be wrong, we'll discuss that if you want, its normative problems do not thereby disappear. Again, all these normative qualms are constantly articulated in Hungarian and even European politics. 
with the exception of the governmental party to those who care inside and outside Hungary, the legitimacy of the enterprise has been seriously damaged. A constitutional reform that usurped radical constituent powers could perhaps be made legitimate if at issue were only its procedural origins. Then with the passing of time and serious constitutional jurisprudence by a court, a secondary level of legitimacy could emerge. But here it is also a matter of content whose illegitimacy is likely to become clearer and clearer as the new provisions actually go into effect. And if, and if, for example, a packed and intimidated constitutional court visibly surrenders its earlier role of protecting fundamental rights. How can the process be now legitimately concluded? That's the final section of my presentation. In one respect, Fidesz itself may have implicitly recognized the legitimacy problems of what it has done. Contrary to an early idea of adopting the Spanish-Dutch type of, am of amendment rule in the fundamental law that would have required the assent of two parliaments in different sessions voting by two-thirds, it has preserved the old parliamentary single chamber, single session, two-thirds rule for the future. This was under the impact of criticism that claimed, rightly in the given case, wrongly in the abstract, that such a new rule would cast the fundamental law in cement depriving future parliaments of the very same power that Fidesz has used now. Such argument, however, belongs to the tradition of parliamentary sovereignty in one particular interpretation, refuted by H.L.A. Hart, for example, that parliament cannot bind another parliament exactly of the same type. The powers of one accordingly belong among powers of the other. The argument is inconsistent with written constitutions and their entrenchment, thus with what Kelsen called constitution in the formal sense. In practice, it is overcome not with the other possibility inherent in the alternative idea of, of an omnipotence, namely that God is so powerful that he can create a stone that even he cannot lift, but with constituent and constitutional assemblies generating higher legitimacy than available to ordinary parliaments. In the United States, this was done by involving ratification through special assemblies. That was not a requirement in the case of ordinary lawmaking. There are other ways of accomplishing the same surplus of legitimacy as already discussed. My point, however, is that Fidesz did not avail itself of any of them. Thus, it was particularly vulnerable to the charge that it didn't have the right to bind future parliaments to a greater extent than it, the present one, was bound. It did not wish to expose its product, for example, to ratification either by a referendum or by two-thirds of the next parliament, exactly as in its new own proposal for an amendment rule. Instead, Fidesz backed down in the face of the performative contradiction and left the existing amendment rule in place. This fact is highly significant for the future. If the process was left open in 1989-1990 and was open in 2010-2011, it remains open exactly the same way now. What was a bad amendment rule under fairly reasonable constitution is now a token of possible improvement under a bad one. Even the Fidesz electoral rule currently proposed is a double-edged weapon. With a shift in the electoral arithmetic, the opponents of the fundamental law could wind up having a constitution making qualified majority. Of course, that is only one possible scenario. Another is Fidesz retaining two-thirds with fewer votes, which is the intention of its electoral rule. We cannot know why they would do, uh, what they would do to the rule of law, separation of powers, and democratic accountability if they had a second so-called mandate, but there is reason to fear. In spite of the disproportionality of the, likely electoral of, I'm sorry, of the current electoral rule, of the new electoral rule, there is also a likelihood that no party will gain constitutionally making majority, even in coalition with others. In that case, given the number of new two-thirds laws, the country can become ungovernable and the constitution, as the constitution makers of 1989-1990 already feared. Moreover, with the long-term appointments already made by Fidesz, the dead hand of the past continue to govern, especially if there is a new majority. The constitutional court made by Fidesz that is currently meant to be quiescent might reassert activism to control a new and different government. Those dissatisfied with such outcomes have the choice to wait for the opening provided by the amendment rule. Under fortunate conditions, they would not have to wait too long. 
The nightmare may then be over after the elections of 2014. But in the case of, other, of two other scenarios, things would be different. If Fidesz achieves a new large majority on the rules of its own creation, with a minority of votes, especially in alliance with Jobbik, only extra parliamentary movements and protests can help, can protect the remnants of constitutionalism and democracy reliably. The option then is either a color revolution, even at the cost of illegality, or acquiescence in whatever Fidesz does. I am happy that I will not be called upon to make that unpleasant choice. Others, however, may, may be uh, called upon. A revolution, of course, would not obey the constraints illegitimately put in the Constitution by Fidesz. Fortunately, equally possible is the outcome of a fragmented party picture, with Fidesz no longer able to, able to form a government, even with Jobbik. A new coalition government would still have to face the hurdles established in the fundamental law, and thus the problem of ungovernability. Under these conditions, much would depend on the availability of a right-wing force outside of Fidesz or emerging from its midst, capable of making a new constitutional compromise with other parties. That could take the form of a new round table, a constitutional convention, or even a return to the rules of 1994-1996 to produce a new constitution. All this can be done legally by using the amendment rule of the fundamental law to produce a new constitution making and ratification rules. Such a legal regime change would, however, assume that two-thirds of the votes in parliament are available or attainable. Many of the right will have to be convinced, and even here extra parliamentary movements and pressure would have a role to play. The problem would be less serious by far if the new government had the two-thirds, though even then a widest possible a widest possible inclusion of other forces as against the effort of 2011 would still be highly desirable. The difficulty arises only if there is neither two-thirds nor a right-wing partner. In that case, the unpleasant choice of revolution, the Republican form of revolutionary reform, or passive acceptance of ungovernability remain three options now for a new government in place. I do not know what would be my choice. The best of these three options would be perhaps revolutionary reform involving one specific break in legality, probably in the form of the temporary restoration of the Constitution of 1989-1990, and entrusting a new body, a convention, or a roundtable to recommend a new draft that could be passed by a referendum if the parliamentary votes are unavailable. I am afraid, however, such a double differentiation of Constitution drafting and legislative bodies has little tradition outside the United States and some Latin American countries. A democratically elected parliament cannot easily defer to another elected body uh, to the extent as did the communist parliament of 1989 that also did so rather unwillingly. Thus revolution or a radical version of revolutionary reform are more probable scenarios with the parliament again taking constituent power for itself, this time under a legal break, break with the full repudiation of the constitution, the fundamental law. Unfortunately, revolutions, even the color ones, are only exceptionally the foundations for constitutional democracy. But as I argued today briefly, even revolution could in its stages, subsequent to legal break, adopt legitimation principles generated by the process of regime change in Hungary and especially elsewhere, in Poland, Bulgaria, and South Africa, inclusion, publicity, and subsequent legality, and perhaps ratification by either a new constituent body or the new parliament. If there has to be illegality in Hungary, the process of replacing the fundamental law should nevertheless be one that in the end still, still earns the adjectives of the rule of law, Reichstag, or as we say in Hungarian, Yogalam. Thank you very much.